We're going to begin with ominous warnings from the Biden administration that Russia has the troops in place to possibly invade Ukraine at any time and that American citizens should leave the country within the next 48 hours. Other countries, including Britain, are urging their citizens to do the same. And as we come on the air, President Biden is pressing to get on the phone with Russian President Vladimir Putin soon in his ongoing attempts to de-escalate the crisis. Which sent shockwaves through the financial markets today. The Dow, NASDAQ, and SP plummeted on fears of war. Russia for months has been surrounding Ukraine with troops saying it wants to enforce red lines to make sure that its former Soviet neighbor doesn't join the NATO alliance. Russia is now conducting massive military drills with neighboring Belarus. And also tonight, a brand new CBS News poll finds a slight majority of Americans would prefer the U.S. stay out of negotiations with Russia and Ukraine. Look on a mask with my boy. Today is Tuesday, February 15th. This is a recap for the stock market activities today. Folks, I got a good one for you tonight. And of course, due to unforeseen circumstances, I was off yesterday. But rest assured, tell your friends, your family, your parents, your kids, your husband, your wife, your mister, your mistress, the Maverick of Wall Street is back, bitches. And you know what? We got a lot to talk about here, a lot of catching up, so let's not waste any more time. Let's start by brushing off on this uh, Russia-Ukraine thing because it's moving the market as of late. Bad news about Russia-Ukraine, stock market goes down. Good news, as you've seen today, the stock market bounces higher. Yesterday, of course, the market was shook down after President Zelensky of Ukraine came out and said, hey, by the way, February 16th, meaning tomorrow, that will be the day of the invasion. What do you know? The stock market took a leg down right away. And then he retracted the statement and said, I was just joking. Let's make it a day of unity, quote unquote. And now, after the Gen Zers begged Vladdy Daddy not to go to war, today, Vladdy Daddy came out and said, okay, I take deal. We don't go to war. So apparently, the Gen Zers on TikTok are more effective than U.S. diplomats, who, by the way, cheering for war, just so you know. And here is the situation for now. As you can see from the map, we are concerned about newly positioned Russian troops across the border. And as you can see, not a lot. A little bit within Russia, and then Crimea, but nothing in Belarus, besides the exercises. And the talk for now is that perhaps Russia pulled back some troops from the exercises in Belarus. But it remains to be seen if this is a legitimate de-escalation or Putin is playing games once again and he will surprise all of us with an invasion, perhaps by tomorrow. Who knows? Could happen. And the main problem for now is the pipelines that extend all the way from Russia through Ukraine all the way to Germany. In my reading, as you can see from the map, if the Nord Stream 2 is approved, no sanctions, no future problems at all, then the importance of Ukraine goes out of the window. Because as you can see, Nord Stream 2 solves the problem. No more pipelines from Ukraine, it goes straight from Russia all the way to Germany. And of course, today the German Chancellor got the long table treatment that Macron got. And this meeting perhaps is the most important meeting, because whatever Germany says, whatever Germany wants to do, will impact this situation dramatically. I've heard the exchanges between Putin and the German Chancellor. He said that Gazprom signed deals with Germany to supply cheap gas all the way to 2036. And it appears from now that the Germans, at least from the press conference, they're not so excited about sanctioning Russia or canceling the pipeline. It is indeed in their national interest to get the pipeline approved. Cheap gas from Russia, no more problems for Germany looking for energy. Because so far, the United States did not offer any alternative to Germany, at least any sustainable alternative. But be careful out there of countering the narrative from the military-industrial complex because you might be labeled as a Russian propagandist, like Zero Hedge, for example, because that's the threat. 
God forbid somebody listens to Zero Hedge out of all people and take that as fact over the official narrative. I don't know about you, but it appears that one side is cheering for war, and that happens to be our side. I have no clue if Putin's gonna invade or not, but it appears that the cheerleading is happening from our side. Anyways, regardless whether we have a solution, a permanent solution right now to the tensions between Russia and Ukraine or not, let's say, hypothetically speaking, that the tensions are over for now, for whatever reason. The market will have to face the inevitable, because even if we take off Russia from the wall of worry, you still have the most important item on the wall of worry not solved yet. And this item is the hawkish Fed. So the market might have celebrated today, but sooner or later it's going to face the same problem of higher inflation and the hawkish Fed. So Jerome Powell, the hawk, for now, remains the final boss. For market bulls to defeat. And one of the top hawks from the Fed is James Bullard, the St. Louis Fed. James Bullard came out on Monday and said that the central bank's credibility is on the line and the Fed needs to front load rate hikes, meaning that Bullard did not back up. If anything, Bullard doubled down. But even Bullard remains delusional about the facts. He came out and said, our credibility is on the line. We do have to react to the data. However, I do think we can do it in a way that is organized, not disruptive to markets. And I say to Mr. Bullard, I want to have an affair, but I want to do it in a way where it's not disruptive to my marriage. I think that's doable, right? Anyways, let's move on to the main topic of this video. And here it is, in focus tonight. How about a check on the sentiment of the market? Are we getting too bearish here or are we getting a little more bullish when we're not supposed to? Let's see. But before we do that, let's talk about inflation for a little bit because it ties up with the sentiment in the market. And yesterday we had Valentine's Day. And oh boy, that cost you an arm and a leg, didn't it? Let's just say that being single is inflation proof right now. Because if you bought candy for your loved one, that cost you 56% more year over year. Greeting cards, that is 40% higher than last year. Flowers, 37% higher. Evening out, that would cost your arm and leg for sure. 31% higher than last year. And lastly, jewelry, 22% higher than last year. And according to estimates, the geniuses spent over $6.2 billion in jewelry yesterday. And let's say this, if your girl is asking for jewelry, eh, run for the hills get out because guess what if she's into jewelry there is always always a guy who can afford more carrots than you can so get out but here it is 4.3 billion dollars were spent on the evening out yesterday flowers 2.3 billion candy 2.2 billion greeting cards 1 billion dollars and after all of that spending some folks didn't even get laid anyhow and by the way, if you feel bad that you were single last night and you didn't have a loved one, or maybe your girl dumped you right before Valentine's for a bag of virtual dicks, it's a tragedy. But that pales in comparison with this. We have a venomous cobra snake running loose in Texas. Can you imagine sitting down in the toilet taking a leak and then the cobra comes out and bites off your cobra? What a tragedy. And ladies, this is why men piss standing. We want to know what's going on down there. It's evolutionary biology. Anyways, I'm pretty sure that the viewers in the comments who keep saying that I let my kid watch the show with me, thank you for the education, are now really thanking me for the education, right? It's not a show for kids, folks. Maybe someday we'll make a show for kids, but right now, this is an adult show. Anyways, here's market sentiment for you. We start with consumer sentiment. Consumer sentiment dropped down to a stunning level. A drop the likes that we've never seen before, as inflation expectations hit 13-year high. The reading for February was down 8.2% below the number for January. That's a massive drop, and this consumer sentiment reading is the worst in about a decade. Unbelievable. And as you can see, there is a high correlation between the rise in inflation expectations versus consumer sentiment. And the tragedy from all of this is that consumer sentiment is translating into consumer spending. And when consumer spending goes down, as you can see, we have on top the University of Michigan Consumer Sentiment Index. And then we have the survey for buyers who say that now is a bad time to buy anything, specifically durable goods. This is the highest reading we've seen since the 1970s. And all of this is translating into a weaker buying appetite. Matter of fact, this is the weakest buying appetite since the financial crisis in the aftermath of 09. If the consumer is not willing to spend due to the rise in inflation, then who's going to support corporate earnings? You see, the only argument that we have right now supporting the stock market is fundamentals. 
corporate earnings. The bulls were counter. You say, hey, look at the wall of worry. We have a hawkish Fed. We have inflation. We have Russia. We have yada, yada, yada. The bulls will counter and say, what about the fundamentals? What about corporate earnings? A lot of corporate earnings came out pristine. Top lines up, bottom lines up. The problem with all of that is that corporate earnings is a lagging indicator and consumer expectations is more reliable here. When consumers say we're not going to spend more because inflation is surging out of whack, Perhaps we're seeing right now peak corporate earnings. You see, the geniuses, the propagandists, the pumpers, the likes of Jim Cramer, who came out today and said, you gotta buy the dip because we're seeing peak inflation. Buy, 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 buy. How about peak corporate earnings, not peak inflation? And the correction that we have in the NASDAQ right now, it appears to be severe because individual stocks are down big. Some are down over 80% from the highs. But the overall NASDAQ is only down about 15% for now, which is, by the way, a garden variety correction that we get pretty much every single year. So we haven't seen the end here because as you can see, we have a trend. You get a massive drop and then the NASDAQ recovers and creates another trend higher. And then we see another massive drop ending the rally, the previous rally. But the drop marks a new trend, a new bullish trend, as you can see, marking higher lows. This time around, we're seeing something different. We're seeing lower lows, not higher lows, meaning that this time, this drop, has a different taste to it. And even when we look at profitable companies, companies that are perhaps defeating inflation because they have the pricing power, even these companies are not performing as the 10-year treasury moves higher, due once again to higher inflation expectations. So the question here is, are we overdoing some of these drops, even in profitable companies, or are we indeed in peak earnings? This is an interesting and a very important question to ask. And here it is, even the quality index, which uh, represents quality growth, even that index is down, hand in hand with a sell-off in bonds. And of course, when we have a sell-off in bonds, yields move higher. And this is yet another indicator for market participants that we're seeing a lot of cash being raised because we're not seeing money coming out of equities, chasing bonds, or chasing cryptos. Some of that money is chasing commodities for sure, and now gold, yet the ratio of outflows versus inflows in stocks, commodities, be it whatever, is pretty wide. What does that mean? We're seeing a lot of folks dumping stocks and raising cash and waiting on the sidelines. Another one in sentiment indicators. Look at this. This might be confusing to you, but this is the gap between analysts' estimates, you know, the geniuses, the experts, and the reality of the NASDAQ. And the higher the reading, the bigger the gap to the downside, meaning that the analysts are way off so far. They overestimated their NASDAQ target by being too bullish, perhaps blindly bullish. And even Goldman Sachs now cutting their S&P 500 forecast to below 5,000 as inflation worsens. Matter of fact, Goldman Sachs says, sell what you can and raise cash. This is according to Goldman Sachs. And even Morgan Stanley's Mike Wilson, who, by the way, his whole spiel is to say that the market's going to drop about 10 to 15 percent. And he says that over and over and over and over again until it happens and everybody thinks that Mike Wilson is a genius. Meanwhile, even a broken clock is right twice a day. He's the opposite of Tom Lee, who says the market's going to go higher, 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 higher. Meanwhile, even my dog knows that. When the Fed is easing, of course the market's going to go higher. But now Mike Wilson says we could see a polar vortex in the stock market. And I don't know why Mike uses these big words. Polar vortex, ice and fire, gates of hell. How about uh, a drop, a correction, a uh, sell-off? You don't need to jerk off when you issue statements. I mean, you're riding a call, a stock market call. You're not riding the gladiator. Anyways, even among the retail crowd, the mom and pops, sentiment is bad. It is not as bad as we got back in January when the bearish reading was around 53%. We are now down to around 35.5%. But notice this, the bullish reading is down. We went from 26.5% in the beginning of this month down to 24.4%. So we're seeing a lot of bulls, a lot of bears migrating to the neutral side of the market, meaning raising cash, wait and see and today we got the investor sentiment survey from bank of america and as you can see when market participants were asked where do you think the fed's put is and if you're not familiar with the fed's put 
it is a level of pain where the Fed has to react and rescue the stock market. And according to the survey, the majority say it is below 3,750 on the S&P 500. So we have a lot of pain to go here before the Fed's put kicks in. Another finding from the survey, when market participants were asked which of the following is most likely to lead the S&P 500 above 5,000 in 2022, the majority say, matter of fact, about 40% say, if the CPI falls down to 3%. Now, this is pretty much impossible, even with the cooking. It's not going to happen, absent of a recession. If a recession happens, the stock market is not going to go to 5,000 for sure. And number two, if the Fed just hikes two to three times, again, no way. They will hike three times in March, probably. So we have more hikes to come. This is a fantasy. It will never happen absent of a recession once again. And if a recession happens, there is no 5,000 on the S&P 500. And while we're seeing extreme readings when it comes to the sentiment on the bearish side, and we're seeing certain stocks crashing, believe it or not, the majority of market particip participants remain bullish on the majority of the stock market. They're only bearish on bonds, U.S. equities in general, meaning the indices, and tech. But they remain hyper bullish when it comes to banks, cash. Notice this, cash. That's an option. Who cares what Ray Dalio says? Ray Dalio been down for years now. They're also bullish on equities in general, not just U.S. equities, but perhaps overseas equities, commodities, still bullish, European stocks, bullish, healthcare, energy, materials, emerging markets, industrials, net-net market participants remain bullish on these corners. But despite the sentiment when they say they're not bear, excuse me, they're not bullish on tech, and this is important, so pay attention now, because we have actions versus words, meaning when we ask market participants, retail mom and pops, and perhaps the institutionals too. They will say one thing, perhaps reacting to the news, reacting to the Fed's policy, and they might say that they're bearish, but their positioning says otherwise. For now, the overweighting, the most crowded trade remains long U.S. technology stocks. What does that mean? If we have more unwinding in the stock market, we will see more pain in technology because the positioning, despite what they say in the surveys, they remain overweight and overcrowded tech, meaning we could see more sell-off in the technology sector of the U.S. stock market. And once again, despite these sentiment surveys, which might show bearishness, all in all, market participants remain risk-on net net be it in the dollar s&p 500 nasdaq the 10-year treasury gold a matter of fact they're perhaps shifting to risk off when it comes to oil and energy so this is really interesting here and here's even a more interesting finding as you can see in light blue cumulative equities flows they remain historically high. We have never seen such flows in the stock market. On the other hand, in dark blue, the net overweighting for equities is actually going down. So what does that mean? It means that we're seeing one side in market participants buying the dip and flowing money into the stock market, while we're seeing perhaps another side maybe a bigger side actually lowering their exposure to equities and raising cash. So who's buying the dip and who's raising cash? Here's the answer. The headline reads, Retail flows suggest long-time investors have felt the pain and are pulling back while newer entrants are piling into the dip. Uh-oh. We have a new batch of sheep about to get slaughtered. They're joining the party after the party's already over. These are the new entrants to the stock market. Data on new brokerage accounts released by Charles Schwab shows monthly growth rose to 233,000 in December from an average of 133,000 from June to October. The correction in January has probably attracted an even larger pool of investors that were waiting for an opportunity to join, said Van der Research. Once again, uh-oh. And again, this is Charles Schwab, meaning this is not the Robin Hoodiets, this is not the meme stock investors, these are the real mom and pops. Real retail investors opening accounts on Charles Schwab because they think this is a great time to buy the dip. These are perhaps middle-class families, maybe a little higher middle-class families, who are buying the dip right now, not knowing that the Fed is tightening, and perhaps the party is already over. Now understand this, at some point after bubbles peak, the job of the stock market is to be a vacuum, to suck away all of the excess liquidity that the Fed printed and now landed on households' accounts. The stock market's job is to suck all of that and transfer the wealth 
from these families to the sharks on Wall Streets or perhaps shorting the stock market right now because the inflation problem will not go away so long as we have excess liquidity in the system. You're seeing the reverse repo facilities sky high so the excess liquidity in banks is being also sucked by the vacuum this time around it's the feds vacuum which means you're not going to lose money the banks don't lose money but the excess liquidity among the population the public how are we going to suck that away well we create dips in the stock market and these fools join they buy the stock market they buy the dip they lose their money and here we go the liquidity is out and inflation starts to cool down. Retail investors are buying the January dip in force, especially in these four stocks. And among them, by the way, perhaps the most expensive stock in the market right now, Tesla. Once again, uh-oh. And despite the hawkish Fed, these new entrants, the new batch of sheep, they say, who cares? Who cares about the hawkish Fed? We don't even know what the Fed is. All I see is Tesla went down and it's been going higher. Every dip is being bought so i'm buying the dip and here it is an example of the divergence between sentiment indicators and actual positioning in the stock market specifically when we talk about the retail crowd in dark blue the sentiment indicator and as you can see it is down the sentiment is bearish no doubt about it at all yet the positioning the flows are still sky high we're still seeing billions if not trillions joining the stock market and buying the dip some of that not just mom and pops opening accounts on Charles Schwab. Some of that is money from banks managing retail investors' accounts, for example, Bank of America. While the strategists at Bank of America remain bearish, they have no problem at all buying the dip using your money. U.S. large caps attracted inflows of $34.1 billion in the week to February 9th, the most on record, according to Bank of America strategists. That at a time when the Fed is set to embark on an aggressive rate hike path that Bank of America says is not a recipe for big market returns. Da -da -da -da. In total, equity funds pulled in another $46.6 billion in the week before a hotter than expected U.S. inflation print which fueled concerns of more aggressive rate hikes. The move was funded by withdrawals from cash, which lost $47.5 billion on bond funds. For the year, to date, cumulative equity flows amounted to $153 billion, beating the pace of early 2021 that led to a record $1 trillion going into stocks. The positive flows toward equities come as an index of U.S. investor sentiment known as AAII, the American Association of Individual Investors, has fallen to its lowest level since August 2020, according to the strategists led by Michael Hartnett. They also noted a big reversal in credit flows, with the asset class losing $32 billion year-to-date, compared with $58 billion in flows over the same period in 2021. And here it is. We talked about the mom and pops within the retail crowd. What about the Robin Hoodiets, the Gen Zers and likes? Well, they say I'm being careful just in case, as stocks keep selling off. Some retail investors are being more cautious and changing their investing habits amid the recent market sell-off. I'm investing a little differently because of the volatility, Tom Abruzzo from Long Island, New York, told Yahoo Finance. I'm choosing individual stocks because there are some great deals out there currently. See, these Robin Hoodies are becoming better investors as time goes and they're learning the hard way but the retail mom and pops who just bought the dip they haven't learned the lesson yet interesting and this is according to another retail investor a robin hoodie who runs a stock market hat shop as a hobby and this gentleman also said i'm also being careful by not putting as much into the stocks that i like just in case they keep on selling off. But rest assured, we have the Robin Hoodiets who continue to buy the dip. They're not gone. They're still here. And according to Wall Street Bets, the daily discussion on Monday included, the Fed will boost stocks, Russia won't invade, and you won't make any money regardless of what happens. Okay, that, that sounds really intelligent, right? Another donkey says, I've never traded the market. That made less sense. It actually makes sense. It was a mania, it was a hyper bubble fueled by the Fed's cocaine. And now the Fed is removing the cocaine due to inflation. And these valuations, the sky high valuations, are coming down in a so called reversion to the mean, as Jeremy Grantham would say. And that mean is way down there. Anyhow, retail investor Abruzzo, this is the smart guy, puts some of the sentiment into context as he tells Yahoo Finance. I think there is so much uncertainty what's priced in currently a few things are happening at once right now 
and I just think retail is becoming more cautious. Not everybody, Abruzzo. The donkeys are still here. But the sentiment all in all is shifting more to neutral. People are raising cash, including myself, and we're staying on the sidelines, waiting to see what happens. And by the way, if you're part of the Robin Hoodiets, the retail crowd, how could you not learn after the SPAC mania, for example, which all of you have been touting? SPACs are the future, bro. SPACs a good deal because you're not going to lose more than 10 bucks. And Shamath Palahapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapapap
Stocks faced another session of wild swings as traders assessed the largest geopolitical developments amid worries about a Fed policy mistake. The S&P 500 ended the day 0.4% lower, falling for the third straight session but closing off the intraday lows. And today we saw the recovery, but here's the take, the final take, in this segment. As you can see, it is intelligent to buy the dip and to buy stocks when the yield curve is steepening. It is also intelligent to lighten up on stocks when the yield curve is flattening. As you can see, the yield curve in yellow, orange, whatever that is, and the S&P 500 in blue. Are we seeing a steepening yield curve, meaning that yellow part of the chart, is it moving higher or is it dropping down, flattening? The answer is right now it is flattening down. And perhaps this is a leading indicator that the yield curve will invert at some point this year. And if it does, it has always, always been a reliable indicator that a recession is on the horizon. And if a recession is on the horizon, then forget about corporate earnings, forget about everything. Stocks are going down. Anyhow, folks, we're going to move on here to cover the market information for you. And we start with the performance of the indices today. And here we go. The Dow Industrial Average closed in the green, up 422.67 points or a gain of 1.22%. The Nasdaq up 348.84 points or a gain of 2.53%. The S&P 500 also higher by 69.40 points or a gain of 1.58%. What about the sector's performance today? Pretty much all in the green with exception of utilities and energy. Energy was the laggard of the day. It popped higher after the Russia-Ukraine tensions and now that we're seeing de-escalation, energy is down. Yet the gains were led by at number one, capturing the gold medal, technology, at number two for the silver, cyclicals, at number three for the bronze, healthcare. What about the advance to decline ratios? NYSE 79% advancing versus 19% declining. The NASDAQ 83% advancing versus 13% declining. And again, look at the 52 week highs versus the 52 week lows. Despite the advance to decline ratios, we're seeing more 52 week lows than 52 week highs meaning the breadth underneath it all remains extremely bad. And the gains are happening by the largest names, the big caps, NVIDIA, Tesla, etc. Moving on to commodities, futures, the obvious is energy down, specifically crude oil. The WTI was down almost three and three quarters of a percent. Brent was down almost three and a half percent. Gasoline down almost four percent. Heating oil down almost three and a half percent. Massive pain for energy, but you got to keep it in perspective here. We're only taking the off from the Russia-Ukraine tensions. Both the WTI and Brent remain trading above 90 bucks a barrel. On the other hand, natural gas actually moved higher today and gained almost 4.5%. What about softs? The rally in lumber once again capturing the attention of the media. Lumber surging higher by over 3.5% today alone. They're going to continue to buy the dips over and over and over again. Watch how fast they're going to buy the dip in crude. But back to softs, we also got gains for coffee. Coffee price is unbelievable. A gain of almost 1.5% today alone. Likewise, we have muted gains for OJ and cocoa. While cotton pretty much in the flat line, the decliner of the day in softs was sugar, losing almost 2 and 3 quarters of percent today. Metals, gold and silver pulling back. A lot of flows looking for safety due to the Russia-Ukraine tensions. Now that the Russia-Ukraine tensions are off the table, at least for now, we're seeing some profit taking in gold and silver. Perhaps we will see dip buyers in the coming days. But likewise, a reliant on the Russia-Ukraine tensions is palladium. The concerns were that palladium prices will shoot up higher if we get any supply restraints from Russia and Ukraine. Well, now that we're seeing easing of the tensions, at least for now, palladium is down over 4% today. And notice, on the day that palladium is down, chip stocks are leading the gains in the stock market. Platinum also losing, but be it modest losses when you compare it to palladium. On the other hand, the gainer of the day is copper. Copper closing in the green, gaining almost half a percentage point today. And by the way, all of these high copper prices, we talked about crime, the rise of crime in this country. Well, Tesla chargers are being robbed by thieves looking for copper wires. So again, with the rise of inflation, we see a rise in crime, and the rise in crime pushes inflation higher becomes a vicious cycle here. What about meats? Modest gains for live cattle futures. On the other hand, look at that. Massive gains for feeder cattle futures up almost 3.5% today. What about the new big tech? Steady Eddie moving higher again, gaining almost 2% today. 
Grains, a bad day for grains. Grains were moving higher on the heels of the tensions between Russia and Ukraine. The two countries combined one of the largest producers of grains across the globe. Therefore, wheat prices down, corn, soybeans, soybean meal, soybean oil, rough rice, oats, canola, everything is down today. But one commodity in grains remains higher is palm oil. And this remains concerning, at least for me. If you've been watching the show for a little while, you know I'm passionate about this. The deforestation in Indonesia and the extinction of wildlife as a result to make room for more palm oil plantations. Why? Because the consumption from India remains sky high. There's a large poor population in India and they cannot afford soybean oil, sunflower oil, palm oil remains the cheapest option. This is a major problem. And by the way, are you seeing any of your beloved billionaires who pretend to care about the planet doing anything about this problem? Of course not. Because there is no credit, there is no virtue signaling in this one. Moving on to options, the big casino, what's going on here? Look at the volume, down all in all, despite the so-called market rally. Without the participation of buying call options, this rally is not sustainable. But despite that, the hottest table by far remains Apple at around 900,000 contracts traded today. About 58% of those were calls. And at number two, Tesla, the souffle, with a little over 600,000 contracts, about 56% of those were calls. And notice that the so-called Tesla whale is active again. He continues to buy out-of-the-money call options with a weekly expiration, high volume, to initiate a gamma squeeze, and then they dump right away the very same day or by the end of the week. Lather, rinse, repeat. Anyhow, at number three, we have AMD with almost 600,000 contracts traded today. About 73% of those were calls. And here are the unusual activities that took place in the options market today. And let's start with the ticker SPY for the S&P 500. The buying puts here, protection, in this case, the 360 puts for the expiration date, April 1st, with the expectations that the SPY could drop down by more than 19% by then. They paid about one buck and 45 cents a piece to enter the trade. All in all, spending about $2.8 million. What about the ticker GKOS for Glacos? This is a company, if the name didn't give it away, that develops technologies to treat glaucoma. Not the coma that the SEC is in. We need another company for that. But in this case, the name is up big at least today, and somebody's buying puts fading the pop by buying the 50 bucks puts for the expiration date March 18th, with the expectations that the name could drop down by more than 10% by then. Watch out here because the bid to ask ratio is too wide, if you want to follow this trade anyways. In this case, they paid an average of about one buck and 65 cents a piece to enter this trade, all in all, spending about one million dollars. What about the trade for the ticker QQQ, the NASDAQ? The buying puts again, the 321 puts for the expiration date March 4th, with expectations that the name could drop down by more than 10% by then. They paid about one buck and 40 cents a piece to enter this trade, all in all, spending about $850,000. And what about the trades for the ticker XOP? This is the oil and gas ETF. Pay attention to the construction here. They're selling a credit spread a put spread by buying the 99 puts and selling the 104 puts for the expiration date March 4th. And they are using that credit to buy a longer dated put, the 88 put. What does that mean? The trader is raising cash to buy protection in the long run. They're not expecting the XOP to drop down more than 10% by March 4th. But the XOP could drop by more than that, perhaps 10% or more, by March 18th, coincidentally, when the Fed announces interest rate hikes, which the assumption is crude oil prices will take a hit. So this is an intelligent construction here. They paid about one buck and 25 cents a piece for buying the 99 puts for the expiration date March 4th, and they received about two bucks and 30 cents a piece from selling the 104 puts for the same expiration date. Net net, they have about one buck and five cents a piece as credit from opening this trade. Now, they're using some of that credit to buy the 88 puts and they paid about 75 cents a piece for those. So they still have credit. And all in all, the entry cost from this construction is 30 cents a piece. That brought the total for this trade to about $150,000. Once again, very intelligent construction here. I highly recommend that you look at the chart and see what this trader is seeing. 
in the XOP. But continuing with unusual activities that took place in the options market today, what about the ticker RBLX Roblox? It reported earnings after the bill, and the net and the name is down. Last time I checked, around 14%. So somebody got it right here by buying these 61 puts for the expiration date this Friday, February 18th. With expectations that Roblox could drop by more than 17% by Friday, and they paid about two bucks and thirty cents a piece to enter. This trade, all in all, spending about one million dollars. What about the trade for the ticker ZI for Zoom Info? Again, a name that reported earnings after the bell, and it is down big last time I checked. So somebody got it right again by buying the 55 puts for the expiration date, February 18th, with the expectations that the name could drop down by more than six and a half percent by then, and they paid about two bucks and 25 cents a piece to enter this trade, all in all, spending about nine hundred thousand dollars. And lastly, what about the trade for the ticker ARKK for Tesla Witch Kathy Wood? The buying calls, interesting, the 80 calls for the expiration date, April 14th, with the expectations that RKK could pop higher by more than 6% by then, and they paid about 4 bucks a piece to enter this trade, all in all spending about $1.6 million. Moving on to the heat map analysis, what's working here? What's leading the gains? The answer is chips, NVIDIA. Qualcomm, AMD, they're all big, up big, I should say. And the reason is palladium prices are down. We're now going to see the correlation between palladium and chips becoming really relevant. But the big caps did okay today. Apple is up over 2%. Microsoft, Facebook, Google, Amazon, all up. Tesla, another large name, is up over 5%. And this is pushing the indices higher. What's down though? The names that went higher as we started to hear more bad news about the Russia-Ukraine tensions. Energy and gold. Gold is down, energy down, Exxon is down. Oh, by the way, somebody saw this ahead of time because on Friday, we saw an Exxon whale dumping over $120 million worth of Exxon stock, booking some profits. But again, my bet is we will see buying the dip in this name happening over and over and over again. And here are some interesting movers today. Tesla, we talked about that. Even though Einhorn is shorting Tesla again. He ate a massive bag from shorting Tesla before. That was the wrong time to short Tesla. But perhaps now is the right time to short the name. We'll see. Honda is up big. And my take is why take the risk with Tesla, a high multiple name in this environment, when you can buy Honda cheap, really cheap, and capture a decent dividend. With that being said, we had some bad news for Honda regarding the protest in Canada because Honda Motor suspended some outputs in the assembly plant in Ontario, but that should be transitory now that the protest is out of the way. Another important movers are the defense contractors Lockheed, Raytheon, Northrop. They were up big when we heard the tensions between Russia and Ukraine, yet we did not see a massive drop in these names today. And my hunch is they're going to buy the dip again. Because forget about Russia, Ukraine as a catalyst for these names to move higher. Even if that's gone, we have blockbuster deals being approved by the U.S. Defense Department, starting with Saudi Arabia, UAE, Qatar, and now Indonesia, with a deal of a price tag of over $14 billion. So the fundamentals are getting a lot better for these defense contractors. Now, when it comes to Boeing, it's an opposite story because today the FAA removed Boeing's ability to self-certify all Boeing 787 Dreamliners. And look at Phil LaBlue. He's pissed off he did not get his check from Boeing this month. He's not supposed to pump for free. Anyhow, more notable movers, steel stocks, climbing higher today, but watch out because the tailwinds are getting weaker for steel. Matter of fact, if you listen to Cleveland Cliff's earnings, the tailwinds are getting weaker, the demand is slowing down, and therefore, a few weeks ago, last month, I dumped all of my steel holdings. I'm done here. Do whatever you see fit in your own portfolio, but I'm not saying I'm short steel, I'm just saying I'm no longer long steel. Another notable mover, not today, but for the year so far, year to date, Activision is up over 22.5%. And guess who bought Activision before the pump? Here it is, the old man, the big buffet, Warren Buffett, bought $1 billion worth of Activision ahead of the Microsoft deal. The SEC remains in a coma. There are no checks and balances in this jungle we call the market. And now even the old man is using insider information to get ahead. Why not when the SEC remains in a coma? Another notable mover is DoorDash today, up almost 5%. I was short Dash before. I'm no longer shorting the name. I'm not saying I'm going to buy it, but they're getting way ahead of Uber Eats here. Because one category that's becoming really popular and important when it comes to profits for these names, these uh, delivery services, is convenience store delivering. 
Now, as you can see, in pink, DoorDash and GoPuff are the leaders in this category. Way ahead of Instacart, way ahead of Grubhub, way ahead of Uber. And this is becoming a highly profitable segment. I don't think that this is enough to counter the headwinds for DoorDash, primarily the higher wages for drivers. And therefore, I'm not buying the name, but I'm no longer short. What about the ETF heat map? Again, it is a sea of green. Everything is up today, with the exception of energy for the obvious reasons and the defensives, utilities, REITs, staples lagging today. It was an offensive theme all in all. Just look at the contrast between growth and value. Growth is outperforming value by a double. Likewise, international markets are working great. The outperformers are led by the RSX, the Russian ETF, for the obvious reasons. But we also have India up big today. The ticker N, or excuse me, INDA, up big today with gains of 3.5%. India remains the growth central in the global economy. And we've been seeing massive inflows, specifically overseas inflows, into the Indian market. And some would argue that the Indian stock market is in a massive bubble. But the difference between the U.S., stock bubble versus the Indian stock bubble is the growth is still intact in the Indian economy. We have no idea when the Indian economy is going to start to deaccelerate, but the proposition that India is the new China is sexy enough to create international inflows into the Indian stock market. We're now watching the biggest IPO in India's history. The concerns were that perhaps the IPO, the timing for the IPO, is not appropriate as we see central banks tightening and investors' appetite for risk moving down. But after today, maybe it will be a good timing. Perhaps we can squeeze one IPO to suck away retail investors' money before everything crashes. Moving on to charts, we start with SPY, 30 minutes chart for the S&P 500. Again, a gap higher overnight, meaning that the majority of the buying was from algos, on the institutional side combined with short covering yet we're not seeing the retail crowd following through at least today as you can see the trading range was narrow between the support of 443 and the resistance at around 447 now it doesn't mean that it is a bull trap right now because the retail crowd could follow through let's say if we have a confirmation that the invasion is not going to happen tomorrow because we are all on pins and needles waiting for tomorrow's events because the intelligence so far says that the invasion will take place on Wednesday, February 16th. I don't think Putin's going to play this game. When everybody expects that the invasion is going to happen on Wednesday, I think Putin's not going to make it happen. He's going to delay the invasion waiting for a better deal, perhaps a proposal of a better deal, meaning the retail flow could happen tomorrow we could see another pop higher but if the retail crowd doesn't follow through then this pop will indeed be proven as a bull trap we will move down to close the gap and here's the daily chart for the continuous contract for the s p 500 the good news for the bulls is we have the momentum indicators curling higher again. We're seeing the volume receding. The bad news is we have yet to recapture 4,472 as support. So the bulls are fighting back here. They're not giving up. But it is a battle between the bears and the bulls. For now, the bears remain in charge because we have two items on the wall of worry being white hot active, Russia and the hawkish Fed. But the bulls are fighting back at least for now. They're not going to gain significant advantage though until and unless 4,472 is recaptured as support. And here's the daily chart for the SPX, the cash index. We're once again trading above the 200 days moving average, but can the chart close the week above the 200 days moving average or not? This is the challenge for now. A weekly closing below the 200 days moving average will seal the deal for the bears. And it is time to double down on the short side. What about the Qs? 30 minutes chart. What's going on here? Again, a gap higher, closing at the highs of the day. Unlike the SPY, the closing here is a lot better. Meaning that in technology, we're seeing some retail inflow. We're seeing some retail follow through from the institutionals, the algos, and the shorts buying to cover. So this is yet another good sign for the bulls here when it comes to the NASDAQ. Another good sign, at least from an intraday trading perspective, a day trading perspective, which I followed today, could not help myself, is the fact that the NASDAQ went down to retest 352 and it bounced higher. This was a sign to at least buy some call options all the way till the end of the day, in, out, hello, goodbye. But the overall picture remains favorable for the bears, not the bulls. The bulls need to recapture 360 as support and then we're talking. 
Here's a daily chart for the continuous contract for the NASDAQ. Once again, the good news for the bulls is the following. The momentum indicators are curling higher. The volume is moving down slightly. On top of that, the very important level, unlike the SPY, in this case, it's 14,445, was recaptured. So the bulls are gaining significant advantage here in the Qs, not in the SPY. Here's the problem for the bulls. When we look at the NDX, the NASDAQ, a daily chart, we are still way below the 200 days moving average. A guy like me will not buy the dip until and unless we see a retest of the 200 days moving average as support, and that retest is met with success. Otherwise, all bets are off. This is yet another bull trap until and unless the 200 days moving average is recaptured. Here's a 30 minutes chart for the IWM, the 30 minutes chart. What's going on here? It recaptured 204 and a half for support this is the good news the bad news is it is becoming once again overbought not quite yet maybe we have a little more room to go here to 208 but then what are the tailwinds for the iwm and small caps still intact not really until unless the hawkish fed reverses stance and here's a daily chart for the dixie the dollar index it moved to the downside today yet keeping the support of 96 the dollar is going to be highly volatile depending on the news of russia ukraine we're seeing a lot of raising of cash even though everybody says cash is trash don't hold cash but actually cash is a good position to be in right now what about gold did gold move higher as the dollar went down not really gold pulled back after the good news regarding the russia ukraine tensions perhaps we're moving to a risk on at least for today and gold is taking a hit as a result the good news for gold bugs is the following in typical charting behavior when you have a strong sloping line of resistance going on for at least a year when you break above that line you're not just going to rally in a straight line you're going to pull back and retest that line of support and then bounce higher so we're now awaiting the retest of that sloping line for resistance now perhaps support here's a daily chart for the 10-year yield it popped higher today closing above two percent once again and this is what i call the nasdaq dilemma what do i mean by that even if the bad news from the tensions between russia and ukraine is out how do you handle the next obstacle and perhaps the main obstacle for stocks right now which is inflation that is pushing the Fed to become more hawkish. Sooner or later, if the 10-year continues to move higher, above 2%, soon enough we see 2.5%, the NASDAQ is not going to make it, folks. Once again, it's a mathematical formula. When interest rates move higher, valuations move down. When interest rates move higher, you want to be with companies that produce cash today because the value of that cash appreciates in the coming years if the expectations of interest rates move higher. On the other hand, when interest rates move down, as we've seen in the last decade, you want to be with companies that are not producing cash today. You want to be in companies that are going to produce cash in the future because the value of that future cash appreciates in the present time as interest rates move down. What are we seeing so far? Interest rates are moving higher, so you want to be with companies that produce cash today, not the future bro kind of stocks. What about the TLT weekly chart? We're getting closer to the retest of 134.5. The momentum indicators are negative, be it the MACD, the RSI, the outlook remains the same. Yields higher, TLT down. What about the VIX? Four hours chart. What do we see here? The MACD indicator is showing one small red impression on the histogram. This is not a solid confirmation that the VIX is done here. It's going to move down and the SPY is about to move higher. You're not going to feel safe to buy the dip in the SPY until and unless the VIX closes the week below 20. Absent of that, who's to say that this is not yet another ABC pattern? We saw the A leg, we're now seeing the B leg, and soon enough we will see the C leg, which will take us higher above 33. Likewise, here's a four hours chart for the VXN, the VIX for the NASDAQ. Look at the MACD indicator, still showing green impressions of the histogram despite the dip today and the pop in the NASDAQ. Who's to say once again that this is not yet another abc pattern with the a leg done and we're forming the b leg and soon enough we will see the c leg higher which will take us above 40 once again you're not going to feel that you're out of the woods until the vxn closes the week keyword week below 27 and a half moving on to apple popping higher today and capturing 172.4 as support once again this is the good sign for the bulls, along with the momentum indicators curling higher, slightly higher, not by a lot, and of course the volume receding for a little bit. Yet the bears are still here because we have the double top pattern. The momentum indicators not so strong right now. The weakness is still here. On top of that, Apple opened a massive gap, and this chart doesn't like gapping higher or lower it closes the gaps pretty much all the time. So it is a battle. The bears remain in charge, but the bulls are fighting back 
in an aggressive way. What about Tesla, the souffle, and hourly chart? Are we seeing a double bottom formation followed by a bull flag consolidation, which will result in higher prices for Tesla? Perhaps retesting 995 as resistance once again? We'll see. But the bears will count over this. Tesla is too weak to recapture the trend line on its own, and therefore we're seeing cheating. And by cheating, we mean gapping higher above the important resistance line, in this case, the trend line in yellow. One way to beat all of these resistance lines is to gap higher. This is cheating. The problem is, once you cheat, you get caught with your pants down and you lose that support. It turns into a resistance once again. That happened once. Now we're seeing cheat attempt number two, opening another gap. So the bears would say sooner or later, the chart will fail the trend line once again, and we will see a flush down once all the bulls capitulate, all the dip buyers who continue to buy the dip in Tesla capitulate, and figure out that it is not a good time to buy the dip in Tesla. And we have bad news for the souffle, by the way. Reverend Elon Musk is blaming the regulators, aka the fun police, for recalling a feature that makes fart and goat noses from an external speaker in Tesla. And I say, how about just annoying? Forget about the fun police. How about souffle? drivers feeling entitled to be annoying the rest of us. Another one, they say that Reverend Elon Musk gave away 5 million Tesla shares to charity after teasing possible donations to fight world hunger. Let me fix this one for you, here it is. After teasing possible donation to avoid taxes. More bad news for the souffle. The headline reads, Tesla's under investigation after a South Korean regulator said it exaggerated mileage claims for vehicles, including the Model 3. Lie, cheat, manipulate, make fake promises. This is the culture of Tesla. Speaking of the culture of Tesla, how about lacking empathy, humanity, and ethics. For example, we now know that Elon Musk, the monster that he is, has been abusing the monkeys he's using to experiment for his uh, brain chips. They're drilling holes straight on the skull of the monkeys. The chips turn out to make the monkeys aggressive to the point where they're biting their fingers off, like they're eating their fingers. And many of these monkeys died. So again, I say to the Tesla culties, they're probably going to mandate these chips to be installed in our brains. And I say you first, the Elon culties. Go ahead. Let him experiment in your brain, since you think he's a genius in the second coming of Christ. Why aren't you guys volunteering? Oh, because brains don't need chips. They work fine as is. Is that what you're saying? Anyways, Tesla so far as a stock has been um, like the final scene in Scarface. The bullets are hitting Tony Montana and he's not falling down. But at some point, one bullet took him down. Tesla is the Tony Montana stock because it continues to dodge all of these bullets. Even when they land, it doesn't matter. But one of them will take Tesla down. And it could happen from this one because the lawsuit that we're seeing from California against Tesla alleging racism could unfold in a surprising way that will take this stock down. So again, if you're buying the dip in Tesla, I know this is the Teflon stock, but the risk is simply too high. What about BTC, tulips, Bitcoin? What's going on here? The retest of 42,000 is done, and we're now seeing a bull flag pattern. For now, we have a confirmation that 42,000 is solid support, and this is great news for BTC. The assumption is Bitcoin will move higher to at least 48,000, if not the 50,000 territory. And again, you might say, what about if the Russia-Ukraine tensions happen? What if we have an invasion? Then all bets off the table. But so far, when we heard about the invasion, threats, the tensions between Russia and Ukraine, Bitcoin held a lot better than equities. So we could see the rotation from equities to cryptos, as Tom Lee, by the way, is predicting. Tom Lee says, with rates on the rise, he sees money moving from speculative stocks eventually into cryptos, which is another speculative bubble, but for now it is holding a lot better than stocks. Lastly, what about AMC apes? So far, so good for now. And it appears that we're gonna run a retest of 21. And if that happens, in all likelihood, AMC will break above 21. And then we'll take it from there. Because if the stock wanted to give up on 21, it could have done that today. It could have done that yesterday. It is not doing this so far. It is curling its way higher to run a retest at 21. Moving on to the conclusion of this video. What do we have on the economic calendar tomorrow? An important day, we have retail sales, the import price index, the industrial production reading, business inventories, the home builders index, and most importantly, the FOMC minutes. And what do we have on the earnings calendar? We have Barrick Gold, Shopify, Nutrin, DoorDash, NVIDIA, Cisco, and Applied Materials. And with that, folks, I'm done here. This is all I got for you for now. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. I will talk to you again tomorrow.